Hello. Welcome to our panel, uh, More Than Just a Meetup. Um, my name is Kristen. I'm the director of Paradiso. My name is uh, Suzanne. I'm the art and marketing director of Paradiso. Um, so this is a project that we started together several years ago. Um, Suzanne, tell us a little bit more about how you're involved with the event. Um, Kristen is sort of sort of the original uh, progenitor uh, of uh, Paradiso back in our original event in 2016. So I was involved, started to get involved uh, in 2015. Uh, I had recently begun uh, to learn how to build websites and doing a bit of uh, HTML on my own. And I thought, you know, it would be fun if this event had a website. Um, and that's how I got roped into this. Uh, and uh, now I do uh, pretty much everything that anyone sees, hears, or reads about Paradiso. Um, I uh, manage or produce myself. Yep, so everything on the website, all of our social media, um, our prints, everything like that. Um, the the illustrations it, themselves are made by our illustrator, Teal. However, um, Suzanne is the one that produces all of those and um, does all of the design for that. So um, you've definitely oh, seen her work. <laughs> even those spoons that we're wearing, those props, I uh, had those laser cut, um, uh, routed out. Uh, they're based off of Teal's illustrations, but I, I made those and uh, other little props and things like that. Yes. We both graduated. Um, from the Kansas City Art Institute, uh, though not in the same class and not in the same department. I have an illustration degree. Kristen has a degree, degree in animation. Um, and we met uh, at the local uh, Kansas City Lolita's com, really. Like, I, I didn't really run into you during uh, my time in school. Yeah. Um, the school itself is not large, but very divided in a lot of ways. Um, but Something I think that's funny is that when I started at KCAI, they did say, you know, like the people that are at the school are going to be people that you'll probably work with for the rest of your life. And like, I think I took that at face value, but here we are. <laughs> um, and Teal on our staff is also from the Kansas City Art Institute. And we've had a few other people in and out that have been involved. So small world, big world situation. Um, but yes, so I, am the director of Paradiso. Um, I manage the team. Um, I am responsible for making sure that we um, have the appropriate staff, that staff are equipped for their jobs, um, that we're all you know, coordinated to be thinking and doing the same things as much as possible. Um, I also have done a lot of the recruitment for the gala staff as well. Um, and Suzanne, of course, has helped me with that. Um, so, my my devotion goes to my team. <laughs> um, Suzanne and I do make a lot of the bigger decisions um, about some of the um, themes and venues that are used for the event. Um, so I do get involved in a lot of that high level stuff. But um, my primary focus is making sure that my team functions well and that everyone is OK. So. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so let's get started and talk about what is Paradiso. Um, I'm sure most of the those of you here um, watching this stream today and being part of Purgatorio know or have a vague idea of what Paradiso is. Um, so we are a specifically J fashion event here in the United States, um, but we kind of got started uh, after some other events of similar nature. Um, Missouri has uh, two main communities. Um, we have a few smaller ones, but the two main ones here are the Kansas City and the St. Louis communities. And to elaborate, Kansas City is in Missouri. <laughs> yes. Um, and the event is in Missouri. Yes. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very, very important note that we uh, in Kansas City like to emphasize. <laughs> um, Oh, it looks like someone's asking if we're volunteers or if we're paid. Um, oh, are we going to take questions at the end? I suppose that's true. I kind of felt like it tied in with what we were talking it does about. Tie in. So, um, we are a volunteer staff. Um, so I am incredibly grateful and I am always going to be super grateful for everything that the team gives to us for their time, their effort, their ideas, their passion, everything like that. Um, so yes, we are a volunteer-based organization. 
Um, and we got to that place, like I said, um, we started with some other ideas. Um, the Kansas City and St. Louis communities had wanted to have their own sort of mega meet inspired by the work that the Chicago Lolitas put together every year. Um, some of us weren't able to attend that particular meetup and we thought, you know, it would be great if we could see other Lolitas from Missouri and especially St. Louis. Um, so we decided on a location between the two, which is Columbia. Um, it's kind of a small college town that we also have some um, community members in. So this event, um, it was known as L3. Um, this took place for a few years and it was really a sort of um, just a glorified meetup, I guess you could say. Um, we had a swap meet, um, we had snacks, and we took some pictures. And it, and it was, was one day, fun. correct? Yes, it was a single day, mm -hmm. um, most of an afternoon. So it didn't really start until I want to say like one or two, or if I'm remembering, but it's been a while. Um, so because that event was successful, um, a few of us kind of thought it would be interesting to do something bigger, something that more than just people in Missouri would want to participate in and something that we could share with the larger community here in the United States. Um, and that's sort of where Pier Paradiso got started. Um, again, our event is specifically curated to the J Fashion community members. Um, our mission is to provide a safe place for our niche group um, for you to meet and shop and learn about the fashion and the culture surrounding it. Um, and that's, that's really our core goal. Um, so in that vein, we wanted to choose a name that kind of fit with that, um, fit with this idea of a sort of safe, um, you know, ideal location. Um, and that's how we settled on the name Paradiso, which relates to, you know, like a, a heavenly space. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of the start of everything, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, our initial event was uh, based solely on the um, name Paradiso. And so again, we used um, sort of like heavenly body themes. Um, there are a lot of classic sort of Rococo um, decorations and our um, print materials and everything like that were coordinated with that overarching idea. Um, our illustrator Teal put together the initial art. Um, you can see her work there on our guidebook um, with our guest Cadney. Um, and she really helped shape, you know, what Paradiso was going to become. She really had a big hand in helping us define ourselves as an event. Um, so when we started out, we did um, partially crowdfund the initial event. Um, we had a lot of support from those in the community to kind of help us get our um, wheels going. <laughs> um, and then the rest of it came from our staff fundraising, as well as the ticket sales that we did um, leading up to the event. Mm -hmm. uh, we did feature a fashion show our first year and we featured two brands. Um, we had Souffle Song and then we had an indie brand known as Archangel Dollhouse. Um, both of them showed collections there during the event alongside a tea party. Um, and then we also had a sort of uh, marketplace space all in the, um, all the same room. So it was, um, it was quite a bazaar, I guess you could say. Um, like a bazaar. We were joined, <laughs> we were joined yeah. by Lolita Collective that year. Um, and Lolita Collective has always been a huge supporter of our work and um, just a wonderful partner to work with every single year. Um, so we felt incredibly lucky to have them come to this first event. Um, and I think that kind of lent in a way, a sort of um, recognition and trust for more people in the community to kind of give us a chance. Um, there are a lot of things in the Lolita community that I think we are very um, concerned about or we're cautious when trying new things. Um, and so it's it's very understandable that, you know, maybe people weren't sure about us in the beginning, et cetera, and so forth. but. Um, Lolita Collective really gave us a hand with kind of getting our name out there and getting some recognition. So again, incredibly thankful for their work. Hmm. Um, the initial event took place in downtown Kansas City, and we've always maintained to try and keep it either a midtown or downtown location uh, for ease of accessibility. Um, but uh, yeah. 
Um, the event was primarily one day long. It was just a Saturday. And then we had sort of an auxiliary event where we went to a local museum known as the Nelson Atkins and we had a picnic on the lawn um, and we did a tour, but yes. it wasn't really, it wasn't really as structured of programming as we've kind of come to have on Sundays now. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, certainly. Uh, and I suppose that leads into how the uh, following event went, um, kind of getting our feet on the ground and moving towards uh, the eternal reverie. And uh, under that, we wanted to continue the organization's name of, of Paradiso, so you would have that recognizability. Um, but we wanted to give each year a new look and a new theme. Um, and so, uh, let me pull up an image. Yeah, here's just an image uh, taken of 2017. Well, for that one, we chose the Eternal Reverie uh, and settled on something a little more Gothic romance, a little more darker. And it matched the our new venue, which took place in sort of uh, uh, a basement area of a historic downtown hotel with all of this intricate dark wood paneling. Uh, so, uh, that again, everything kind of took place in the same space, a very open social event, a gala, uh, different than uh, a convention uh, that some people are used used to kind of wandering around to find out uh, where their Lolita specific panels are at, at, at a more general event. Um, whereas this has just always been a single a space for everyone to uh, mingle uh, and socialize and shop all together. And then what was really nice about the 2017 event uh, is that it had a much more, uh, much more, uh, I guess, I mean, a structured day two event. We had our guest, Hello Batty, give a special talk on at Webster House, uh, had a full tea party at Webster House, uh, and uh, had a, uh, more special guests. These are our original special guest judges for the Midwest OG Sama pageant, which was also an event that we added uh, for the 2017 uh, event. And we pull up our pageant winner. Uh, here's uh, Avalon, uh, who was uh, sort of the inaugural original prince uh, of the Midwest uh, back in 2017. And uh, they are wearing the sash, the crown, and bouquet gifted to them after being declared the crown prince. Um, and if you guys didn't attend the uh, OG Q&A panel that happened earlier today, uh, the Midwest OG Sama pageant uh, is sort of, a, we wanted something to inspire other J fashion styles, even though our J fashion dress code uh, allows for all J fashion, it is primarily attended by Lolitas since they are the most structured and I think the most populous uh, J fashion community here in the United States and in the Midwest but uh, it would be good to expand to uh, Lolita's uh, brother style OG and feature them and, uh, and also just represent ma more masculine or boy styles. Um, and we wanted it to be a little tongue in cheek, a little funny, uh, people well, a space for people to create a persona, be more exaggerated, be fun, be playful. There were, and people kind of took it and ran away, ran off with it. Uh, there was someone who rapped uh, for their princess, um, someone who, uh, an Avalon, of course, had a very showy display of throwing uh, petals at the audience. And I think that's what uh, won them. So it's not just style and the outfits, it's class, it's character, it's charm. Um, and that's definitely something that we've uh, kept with and it's grown along with the event as well. Right. Um, this was also the first year that we started to get a wider reach um, for our audience. Um, we got our first guest from New York State, which was really, really exciting. Um, we felt incredibly lucky to, you know, inspire someone so far away to take the chance and come out to Kansas City and um, that was really exciting to see that, you know, people were starting to hear about us and starting to want to be here. Uh, yes, that um, most people who had attended uh, the 2016 and 2017 event were from the Midwest area, from Oklahoma, from other parts of Missouri, from Kansas, from Nebraska. Um, and Midwesterners are very used to be able to, to driving a very long distance. 
Um, so that old saying of like, oh, it's just an eight hour drive. Like I'll pop over there. Uh, so, and especially uh, with all of those more scattered, but also to, uh, Kansas City sort of in, in the center of them, kind of, kind of equidistantly an eight hour drive from both Texas and Illinois. Uh, people were willing to travel, uh, more and more willing to travel as the event uh, grew uh, for something that uh, catered to their interests. And I think, uh, I think I have a nice group shot of everybody at the original day two uh, tea party. <laughs> so that's just about everybody. It was uh, hard to cram everybody on the Webster House staircase, but uh, we had a fabulous time. <laughs> we did. And oh, then, I'm wearing the same dress as I am in that picture. <laughs> oh, you are. Yes, Queen's coach is fabulous. <laughs> Uh, and that and that sort of uh, trend moved on into our next event, which is uh, Woodland Arcadia. Let me pull that up. The Luda Collective continued a presence here as well, and this venue uh, was a lot bigger. I had these wonderful stained glass uh, walls that are uh, windows that allowed in a lot of natural light, and it had a stage, which really helped the pageant. We in the, in that flat area, there wasn't any raised platforming. Um, so we just sort of had like just, you know, uh, a, a small set of stairs that people would come down and strut in front of the audience. So now uh, there's plenty of room for seating. There's a stage, there is there is lighting. Uh, this, this was a really, really good uh, opportunity for us to uh, expand the fashion show, uh, the OG pageant and uh, even had a few extra rooms. So Lulu the Collective got to have uh, their own room uh, to spread out and create sort of a mini boutique, uh, which people enjoyed. Uh, and the actual theme, uh, we decided to go with uh, more forests and naturalistic themes. So it was a woodland Arcadia. Um, so Arcadia is a, a realm uh, dwelled in by the god Pan. So it still has that heavenly connection, but something that is like perhaps an earthly paradise or a natural paradise. And consistently we want to keep our themes available for not just someone to just wear Mori and apply to the theme, but someone could do a sweet cord, uh, perhaps with like, uh, oh, what's the name of that uh, AP's deer? You know, that uh, would- Milky Fawn? Milky Fawn. I wanted to say Enchanted Fawn, uh, that would work. <laughs> Uh, Enchanted Fawn, Milky Fawn, but also uh, someone could create a dark forest look or uh, a rose look for something gothic. And that, that would fit as well. And we saw plenty of that. Uh, and then for that one, let me pull up our special guests. Where did those go? Oh, yes. We invited lovely Lore. Um, we had our other two guest judges, Sora and Prince V, return for the Midwest OG Sama pageant, but added Lore, uh, who spoke a little bit about on uh, day two. Uh, and she enjoyed being a judge and uh, interacting with everybody and uh, uh, taking photos with all sorts of people. She was really nice. Um, her name speaks to her. She is lovely. <laughs> it was lovely to have Lore. <laughs> Um, we're very grateful for the time she spent with us. And um, I think that she fit in really, really well with the community here in the Midwest. Um, I know it's kind of a running joke that in the Midwest, people are just very nice, um, but it, it was wonderful to have her. She has just such a warm personality. And I think that everyone really enjoyed meeting her. Yeah, she had just such a great charisma. Like when I first met her at Talker, I immediately felt like, oh, she is a friend. <laughs> If it doesn't sound too forward, but she was just extremely friendly. Uh, and a good time was had by all. Uh, another thing that uh, another thing that we wanted to do uh, is expand our dietary options and have uh, both vegan and gluten-free options uh, for our event. And I think, uh, didn't Nick assemble those cute little log cupcake stands? <laughs> yes, so these cupcake stands were a last minute project um, that my boyfriend got wrangled into um, because <laughs> we needed some place to display all of these cupcakes and we weren't finding anything we liked until I stumbled upon a Pinterest board with these silly 
um, log display stands. And I was like, oh, Nick, those would be easy to make. And I was very wrong. They were not easy to make. Um, but bless him for putting up with me because mm -hmm. I think these were really adorable and they fit with our theme, um, mm -hmm. as did the rest of the, the food. Um, mm -hmm. I personally grew up vegetarian and Suzanne is vegan. Um, so we we have been to many an, ev many an event that we struggled to find anything to eat. So that's always been something that we've put a lot of um, focus on. And this year we had the opportunity to really um, sort of zone in on that and personalize the menu. Um, so the foods were all forest themed. We had these cute little hors d'oeuvres shaped like mushrooms. Um, you know, pretzel sticks, and we had little uh, dirt puddings there. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, even working directly with caterers, um, we try our best to make sure that uh, those dietary options are available. Personally, I uh, any other like tea party that I've been to, um, you know, I want I want to attend obviously because you know I want to see the brand guest or what the other event has uh, as far as programming. But when it comes to the serving, uh, I'll be lucky that they have almond milk for my tea, and I'll be like, all right, I'll just I'll just sit and sip. Uh, no thanks, no thanks, no crumpets for me. <laughs> um, so uh, you you could say that's a selfish desire, but I know other people who are. Uh, lactose intolerant, who uh, have other restrictions, and so and so vegan covers a lot of those as well. Um, people who can't eat certain types of meat, who can't eat fish, can't eat pork, it, it does cover that as well. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'm just pulling up another relevant picture of people watching our fashion show. Um, that year, I believe, uh, Ikemen Mode, uh, Crystal Isis, Crystal Arcade, um, who else? Oh, it wasn't Crystal else? Isis, it was Crystal Arcade, but we also did have uh, Poovy stuff with us that yes. year. Yes, Poovy also uh, was in the show. And was that it? I think so. I think we just had three, maybe four designers. Mm -hmm. um, so we were up from the previous year, mm -hmm. uh, continuing to grow with the fashion show as we expanded. Mm -hmm. We had this balcony area, which we roped off to use uh, during the fashion show, uh, a chaotic space of models uh, uh, frantically getting ready, but it all worked out. Um, and I feel like, I feel like that, and I, every, every, every one of these events, I feel like uh, opens up, uh, opens up more opportunities, uh, brings in more people, gets more attention. Um, so I can't, I can't necessarily point to any, any one of these events being like, oh, well that, that's what happened because there's, there's always so much growing, so much learning, so much improvement that always happens. Um, but I, I think, I think definitely uh, the next event was, uh, it felt like to me the biggest jump up uh, in a lot of different levels. Uh, that theme uh, was, Paradiso Decadence in 2019, um, and we uh, we got uh, Union Station's Grand Hall. It's a historic uh, train station. It is still is functionally a train station uh, here in Kansas City, and they uh, it used to be once when trains were a lot more popular, the kind of the waiting area. Uh, but it's been transformed into a uh, event space, and it is very, very, very big. I remember way back in those earlier events, we had these list of like dream venues of like, oh, this was the this would be the ultimate space, and this was one of them. And so, uh, it was it was a little bit nerve wracking to be like, oh, should we make the plunge? Should we take this? But no other event spaces were really working out. It didn't quite have the facilities that we were looking for, the square footage. Uh, the ability to have staging, and it was a little, a little scary uh, to jump up to something this large, but we found it was necessary. Right, it was, it was a risk for sure, um, but it had been something that we had quietly been dreaming and wishing for, and um, 
ultimately, I think it really was the right choice. Um, there was just so much more room for everyone to spread out. Um, we had a um, lifted runway this year, as well as a very large backstage area for our designers and models to get ready. Um, personally, I have had a lot of um, experiences in the Kansas City fashion community. I've modeled, I've um, done shows, I've done print ads, I've done, um, I've helped with collections, I've been backstage hands. So I've I've seen a lot of things and from those experiences, um, I have tried to bring as much knowledge as I can to our fashion show um, because it's it's different from a convention fashion show where I feel like a lot of J fashion designers are able to show their work. Um, we do try to structure ours a little bit more like a, um, a fashion week sort of setup. Um, and we aim to give our designers a platform to release something new, something that they haven't done before. Um, this is their stage. So it was really wonderful to be able to take up that much space, to have this really over the top grand place for them to present their designs. Um, in that photo was the collection that Triple Fortune um, showed. And they were uh, our special guests. Um, they This was the first year we were able to support a Japanese guest here at Paradiso. Um, it was it was wonderful to have them. Uh, they are definitely one of my um, dream brands, one of the ones that I always kind of thought, you know, like maybe one day I'll get to see Triple Fortune in person. Um, and then it happened. So <laughs> it was just a really wonderful um, experience having them there. Um, and they, something that um, I have, had the opportunity to talk about with the designers of Triple Fortune is their focus on being able to make garments that will fit all sorts of different people. Um, their garments especially often have a lot of shirring, um, either full shirring or at least back shirring. Um, and so when we were choosing models, I remember they really, um, they wanted to focus on diversity uh, as much as they could. Um, and that's something that is reflected in our fashion show in general. Um, we try really hard to host brands that um, give a lot of presence to, you know, maybe um, collections or viewpoints that we don't get to see in sort of the mainstream media. Um, and we also have a very um, strong focus on, you know, any size, any gender identity, um, you know, ethnicity, any of that is welcome to our runway. And we want to see as many different things on the runway as we can. Um, and in my personal experience, I won't name any names, but in my personal experience, a lot of fashion shows, they choose models that are all kind of the same basic type. And that's not to say that those models aren't wonderful, that they don't work hard. Um, but I think it's difficult if you are not someone who looks like a model to, I say model, <laughs> um, to imagine yourself wearing what's on the runway. And I think that's such a big part of what Lolita and J Fashion is, is this sort of transformative element. And if you can't envision yourself in that clothing, then that's, that's not going to be good enough. Um, so we did also get to feature boy style brand uh, Ikumin Mode. Um, they had a really wonderful sort of performative runway show that year. Um, they had um, all sorts of amazing stage direction. I kind of caught on to some of it while it was happening backstage, but then on stage it was this whole um, performance and they had this curtain and it was just, it was wonderful. I am I love that they took the larger stage and sort of ran with it and, you know, turned it into something else. So. Um, that was a lot of fun. I also really enjoyed it. They brought a collection that focused a lot on denim, which was entertaining. Um, they talked a little bit about it in their panel, but essentially uh, most tea parties have a dress code of no jeans, but they made jeans fancy. So you can wear jeans to the tea party now if you wear Eggman mode. <laughs> um, but yes, so I think, um... We also had AP USA participate. Um, it was the the uh, U.S. branch of AP 
uh, but uh, we did have uh, two Japanese brands participate. And then also in the vendor hall, we had Meta through remote sales. Um, and they did, uh, going back to that plus size and uh, inclusivity, they did uh, through us a sort of special like pre-order uh, launch of a plus size version of Daydreaming Gold Goldfish. Um, so that was really exciting uh, to be able to offer that. Uh, to our guests and they and we had some some of the plus size versions sent to us but uh they did like sort of an in-person pre-order as well right um and i remember it was really it was really wonderful having that pre-order um i remember i i don't know who it was but someone was um you know looking at the dresses and i think maybe trying them on or something and they were just in shock because they were like this is too big for me you know this is not an experience they're used to in Lolita fashion is that, oh, it's it's actually too large for me. Um, so I I was incredibly happy that we were able to offer that to our attendees this year. Um, and I, I look forward to the new releases that Meta has in store um, and what else they have planned. So, uh, but yeah, um, I mean, again, Union Station was just such a wonderful venue. It was beautiful. Um, the lighting, we had a lot of natural light, so that was wonderful. Um, lots of opportunities for selfies and group photos and things like that within the uh, the space itself. Um, and then also a photo booth. Uh, we have a photographer who's participated in every year, Shintaro, um, who uh, takes wonderful photos. <laughs> um, and so we have a lot of those uh, memories to look back on. We do. I think this particular photo booth I think it was the most simple that we had put together, but I also think it was the most successful. Um, we had a lot of really fun props that Suzanne had put together, like the, the uh, fork and spoon. And then we had some big paradisos that we'd cut out and some other peas that we decorated and um, just all sorts of fun stuff. We had some chairs. So I really loved seeing, um, you know, all of the things that people came up with to do in their photos. It was, that was a lot of fun. It was. Um, but yeah, I think this theme especially was leaning more towards um, kind of the sweet spectrum, this sort of like over the top food theme um, was the general idea that we went with. But again, it could still be um, reimagined into any style. Mm -hmm. um, I specifically remember there was a group, I think it was a, a trio, a trio that had all coordinated together in black and gold. Um, and they were by all means decadent. Um, and I don't know, I didn't really get the chance to talk to them very much. I don't know if they planned this and they all live in the same area or maybe they planned it online, but they were just such an iconic group. Um, and it was just, I had to stop for a moment and just run up to them and tell them like, you guys are so, so good. <laughs> and that's that's another aspect of Paradiso that we really, um, we really try to emphasize is that, you know, this is your opportunity to take those fashion risks, to wear those things you've always wanted to wear, to go completely over the top, or if you just want to wear something comfy that's J fashion, that's absolutely acceptable too. I certainly had to wear something comfy, um, hence the pizza dress, because um, just my role at the event had me walking back and forth, or really like, almost like jogging, like polite, like, power walking back and forth and back and forth the entire length of how big that venue was. Um, so uh, <laughs> so I had to, had to do something uh, toned down. I didn't even wear makeup because I knew I'd just sweat it off, uh, but that's what I did. <laughs> yeah, I, I too was running around back and forth in that space and I kept joking that I really should have invested in some um, Lolita roller skates or like roller blades so I could get back and forth faster. Oh, like Lolita blades? <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so I would say this was by far our you know most successful event. This was getting close, as close as we have yet to being the event that we want to be. Um, the experience that we want to share. And that rolled into our second day, our tea party um, that was hosted at the Little Theater, which was um, also gilded and in gold and um, beautiful. Uh, uh, what, what, um, 
just zodiac related decorations. Um, I believe that the ceiling is also detailed, if I'm remembering. Yeah, it does. It does have the zodiac um, okay. along it. This is the little theater um, built in the 1920s. It's an oct octagonal ballroom with a small uh, space uh, for a, a stage, hence the little theater. Um, it had a small balcony. Um, I really, really liked the look of this venue. Um, and the pageant as well had its own uh, little runway. And for this one, the pageant ran, for the previous things, the pageant and the fashion show and most of the content would run on day one, but we decided to, decided to move the pageant to day two to give more focus for the fashion show uh, and the designers uh, because uh, day one had gotten so big. And we felt that moving it to day two made sense. Right. Um, we, we wish that we could host every single designer, um, but we were kind of in a position of being overwhelmed by all the amazing applications that we received. Um, so the show was already packed by that point in time and it, we wanted to give the pageant its own space and its own attention. And um, in previous years, it had kind of uh, felt a little rushed, I think. Um, and so moving it into day two gave us a little bit more flexibility with the amount of time and the amount of grandeur that we could uh, give to that event. So And then uh, Sora as well stepped up from being just a judge and a guest judge to helping to actually MC and coordinate the pageant. Uh, so I'm really thankful for his extra work. Yes. Um, he is a performer and a singer in his own right. So he was able to uh, bring the, sh the sense of uh, showmanship uh, that the pageant really deserved. Yes, it was definitely a to do. <laughs> what to do? Um, it was a loud event. <laughs> um, there was definitely a lot of cheering and just a lot of fun stuff happened. So I, I will always remember some of those moments. They were just absolutely wonderful. Um, and yes, our guest was Tyler. Yes, Tyler was our um, one of our featured guests, and she was also one of the judges on the OG pageant uh, panel. Um, and she gave a little Q and A session before the panel started that day on Sunday. Um, she was also there for guests on Saturday to um, have a little bit more of a personal touch, personal greeting um, option for them. Uh, I do remember her saying that she took so many selfies that she had lost track. Um, so I know that a lot of people were very excited to meet her in person, and she was a wonderful guest. Um, she was so fun to be around. And um, I think that she also really enjoyed her time with the pageant from from what I've heard. <laughs> yes, and uh, though I really enjoyed many things about the our day two venue, the little theater, like outgrowing Webster House, uh, we pretty much immediately outgrow this thing. So for 2020, we moved on to an even larger uh, venue space that has multiple levels. Um, so I'm very look, looking very forward to the uh, the space at the Grand Hall of Power and Light. Right. Um, and I suppose uh, so we've kind of summarized uh, how the events were. Uh, we can cover uh, the, the the ethos of uh, Paradiso itself and and what our goals are with uh, this event, which we touched on. Um, both me and Kristen's personal values are kind of woven into the structure of the event. Um, we, we wanted this, this event to be, uh, different than a convention, which is why we don't call it a convention. Um, uh, a convention brings to mind, uh, uh, some sort of large space with lots of little rooms with everything going on simultaneously. Uh, you go and find your one little pan one set of little panels and maybe go find a couple little of your little guests, uh, that you like and want signatures from a more to talk. Whereas this, uh, we call it a gala. And I, I think that uh, matches a uh, description uh, much more accurately. And that is, it is a social event uh, that we all, that is all kind of in the same area. The space itself uh, it aren't really in hotels. They're in venues, that, which are uh, also commonly rented out as wedding venues, but uh, for galas as well, not just paired, not just the Paradiso Gala, uh, but it's a, so a social event uh, with programming as galas do have, but something that uh, brings in uh, 
applies the ethos of Lolita itself and other J fashions to an event, an attention to detail, an elegant space, uh, an attention to uh, uh, the smaller things to create sort of a more singular experience. Right. Um, and I personally, um, I got into Lolita fashion because I have a deep love um, of certain anime titles that are very Lolita-esque, but I also really love historical dramas um, and the clothing that's presented in those. Um, and so for me, when I get dressed up, I want to be in a space that reflects that sort of ideal, um, that image of this just grandeur experience um, with, you know, Rococo details and fancy things. And that's what we really try to share with our audience at Paradiso, um, just an experience that is for the fashion specifically. Um, you know, something that reflects the refinement, that reflects the amount of uh, work that's put into a coordinate, um, that reflects the intricacy of the print on your dress. Um, and that's not to say that any event that hosts fashion programming does not offer, you know, attention to detail or anything like that. Um, but it's it's a different environment. It's a different experience. Um, and again, the Lolita community itself is so social um, that having a general social gathering space for these small interactions to take place is really important, I believe. Um, and in those spaces, we've had a lot of very, uh, very sweet and heartwarming, um, you know, interactions. I have personally seen on multiple occasions um, a designer and a person wearing an item from their collection have the chance to talk. And the the attendee is so excited to meet the designer of this thing that they they love and they were dreaming of and wishing for and waited for the pre-order and now they finally have it. And then the designer is equally excited to see someone love their work and wearing it in person and coordinating it in their own way. Um, and so many of those, uh, you know, micro interactions, they take place in this big, just sort of open space. Um, yes, and because and this community is just so online, it is both very big geographically spread out, right. uh, but also very small. So uh, walking through the event space, uh, I would just hear snippets of conversations, people running into each other, recognizing each other off of Instagram, off of Facebook. They would uh, call each other by their handles first and then become formally introduced and create an actual in-person, in-the-flesh connection. And I think uh, uh, having a space specifically devoted uh, towards this fashion lends to that, uh, having that dress code, knowing that uh, you don't have to, uh, uh, if you're in like another space, like say like uh, a, a meetup where you're at a restaurant with your friends, uh, avoiding those interactions where someone asks you if you're in a play um, <laughs> or even uh, other other uh, events will have fashion shows, but uh, like the one of the local conventions here, we use the same facilities and the same space and often a, a closely timed with the cosplay competition. Um, and so, onlookers may get them confused or may not understand uh, us, but this is a place that's entirely filled with people who already have the knowledge, who already are invested in the community and, and their investment shows with their looks, but also the time and investment they took to come out to here and come visit us in Kansas City. Exactly. Um, they, I don't hear conversations about like, what is this or what are you doing or, you know, like, what character are you cosplaying? And while that might not happen as often at a convention, I have personally been asked many times, <laughs> um, you know, what character are you when I'm I'm dressed up and on my way to the tea party? Um, or just in general, having people consistently stop you to ask for photos. And those photos, they want them not because necessarily they think your coordinate is amazing, but it's just that it's so bizarre and different to them that they're like, oh, I must... I must document this very strange, unusual thing that I have encountered, but that's not something that really happens at our event because everyone is part of the community. They know what the word coordinate means. They know what an OP is. They know brand names. Um, so there's already a level of general um, 
understanding and a vocabulary that we all share that we don't have to, you know, overcome in order to talk about this thing that we love. Um, so I guess we can kind of talk a little bit about things that we've learned um, over the years um, as we've continued to grow and continued to host the event. Um, the biggest one I think is the, the events like this have a large level of responsibility that goes with them. Um, you are tied to that event, you know, months before it happens. Um, it is your responsibility to make sure that as many um, as many things can be accounted for as possible. Um, it's your responsibility to make sure that phone calls get made and that reservations are made on time and, um, you know, uh, accessibility is another one that always has to be considered. Um, we've, we've wanted to be at several venues that didn't have um, accessible second levels. And that means that, you know, we, we can't use those venues because we feel very strongly that our space needs to be accessible to everyone. Um, and it should again reflect those ideals of this elevated sort of experience, this otherworldly, other plane of existence that we're going to that is parody. So, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. And then um, uh, it's a big responsibility at the event as well because uh, our, our, our staff, uh, uh, things that need uh, solving, problems that need solutions, uh, they always come uh, straight to us. So we need to always provide them answers or provide attendees answers. Um, but uh, yeah, you end up being uh, responsible for everything about it. Even if, uh, and even if it's something that uh, ends up out of your control, uh, it, it's still seen as your responsibility as well. And I think the Suzanne in my background brings a lot of um, important experience to hosting an event like this, specifically because um, in in art you often will receive uncomfortable critique on your work, and your work is something that you have put all of yourself into, and you have to learn to separate your personal feelings from your work and accept criticism. Um, you know, valid criticism when it's brought up and be able to look back on what you've done and said and say, you know, that was not executed as well as it could be. This needs to be improved. Um, and that's something that we put a lot of attention on as well. We always send out a survey to collect feedback, the good and the bad. We want to know um, what worked, what didn't work, because then we have more insight to what can be changed and improved for our attendees. Um, because there's one perspective of an event planner during an event, and that's a completely different perspective from, um, you know, an attendee or a guest or a vendor or a designer. And all of those viewpoints are incredibly important in order to continue to grow and continue to become better and better every year. Uh, yes, exactly. And even if uh, you'll end up uh, with... Uh, critique that maybe you might have an initial emotional reaction to or critique that isn't phrased uh, in a way that you want to hear, but uh, you still have to consider it whether and consider uh, whether or not it's getting at something that could be improved or if it's just something that uh, uh, can be set aside or, or disregarded as, as mere, uh, as mere, uh, a misunderstanding or, or, or trolling even perhaps, but uh, it still all has to be considered uh, right. because at the end of the day, the event is for the attendee. It's it's a symbiosis in that this event would not exist if people did not attend. And we also wouldn't create this event if we didn't think it wouldn't benefit the community and, and, and have interest and have draw. And it's the same thing with uh, our designers and our vendors, we're providing this platform for them, but nobody would come if there wasn't a fashion show and if there wasn't vendors. So uh, you have to have, we have to have something to offer them, but they offer uh, a whole lot to us. Right. Um, we also, um, we spend a lot of time, 
you know, learning about our audience. We've sent out a few different demographic surveys. Um, and then being part of the community, of course, we've learned, you know, what what does a Lolita want and what does a, um, you know, OG want? What are those, what are things that make a difference and what doesn't really matter so much? And I think one of the big ones that um, most wedding venue planners don't have any concept of is the fact that they may have a capacity of 300 people, but those 300 people they're expecting are not wearing two petticoats. And so our attendees are, you know, sizably different. Um, you need space to get to your seat. You need a different amount of space to move around in. Um, and so that's always kind of a challenge to sort of, you know, speculate, okay, this this venue is big enough or this venue could be arranged in this way so that our attendees can move through it successfully. Um, so there are just a lot of little things like that that will come up. Oh, and then, and then too, um, most of our attendees are going to be wearing lots of clothing. And, and this event isn't in the dead of summer, but it is in May. So we were like, absolutely no outdoor events. Um, Especially in the Midwest. <laughs> absolutely not. It can, and, and it, 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 it wouldn't even matter what season it is, especially in the Midwest, like you can't account for weather and you can't account for someone's personal preferences. So absolutely not. <laughs> um, and additionally, we, we have a lot of incredibly talented staff um, and they help us in all sorts of ways. But at the end of the day, there are so many things that are part of the event that it comes down to a decision between time and money. Hmm. It's more convenient to pay for something, but it will be more expensive and it will be less expensive to do it yourself. But is the time investment, you know, worth that savings? Um, so that's always kind of a changing and shifting uh, thing to consider. And it, it changes a little bit every year, but um, thankfully, like I said, we've got some really wonderful people on staff. Um, Suzanne especially has really helped us grow with our decor and our presence online. Um, oh so yeah, I got, to make, uh, <laughs> I got to make these things. Uh, I'm, I, uh, I'm a sculptor, even though I have an illustration degree, so I love learning about processes. So I uh, got to learn how to use a CNC laser router and I cut and painted these out of foam. Um, so they're, they're hanging out in my basement. They'll make a reappearance. Uh, but I love these big boys, these big peas. <laughs> and that's kind of a funny thing for us on the Paradiso staff is that we see the Paradiso P a lot. Um, and so when things are laser cut in large numbers, um, those documents are just peas, just a bunch of peas. And yeah, yeah, because our attendee badges, uh, I don't know if I have, actually have any photos of them, but those are also laser cut. Um, they've been laser cut since like, since 2018 at least. Um, and so uh, I don't know if I have one of the attendee wearing them, but like if anyone who's attended, there's a P, you get a P, that's your token. Uh, and so it's just this giant sheet of P's. And so we just go. <laughs> just yes. like, there have been many conversations about, well, where are the P's ready? <laughs> so, um, and then the last note I think we have here before we answer some questions would be that you can always try to expect the unexpected, but as much as you may plan, as much as you may problem solve, um, as much as you may invest, there will always be something that goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's completely out of your control. Um, you know, until we find a um, divination expert to join our staff, or you know, perhaps a profit of some type, um, we won't be able to tell the future. And so there are always going to be challenges that come up during the event that we couldn't have planned for in advance. And it's just very important to respond to those quickly and respond to them professionally. Um, you know, if you don't know an answer to something, find out, you will find out for the attendee or, you know, if someone is ha having some kind of struggle, like, how can I assist you? What can I do 
to resolve this for you. Um, and our staff has always been really incredible with those situations. And there's, they're always, they always present uh, learning opportunities as well, big chances for growth. I remember in 2017 and 2018, the audio situation, though it worked out in the end, was always a nightmare because, and, and it was always things that were entirely out of our control. So we pay the venue to book some speakers and then uh, the venue either didn't provide a cable, was missing equipment. And so one of our staff just had to run around and spend several hours trying to track down somebody to bring our actual audio. Yeah, Kristen, <laughs> to bring our actual audio equipment uh, so we could function and have an actual event. But uh, from an attendee, attendee standpoint, uh, they don't notice any of that. And that's sort of the, the end goal is to create as smooth as possible experience uh, for the people who, uh, can truly enjoy the event. And then those those can be learning experiences later uh, because definitely we're like, okay, let's invest even more and get, uh, <laughs> let's get like the more robust audio packages. Let's get a dedicated audio technician uh, and uh, those can be resolved. <laughs> right. Um, so we've got a couple of questions and it looks like a couple of these are sort of related. So I'll kind of answer them together. Um, so we have one that's, um, how do you go about setting a budget for venues, guests, food, et cetera? Um, and how do you go about getting the funding for the event? Um, so we have been tracking, um, you know, the growth of the event every year. Um, we keep all of our budget information from the previous year. And then using that tracking information, we can kind of guesstimate how much we might grow, what additional attendees we need to account for. Um, and so once we kind of have that general idea, that's when we'll start looking at venues that will meet um, that particular need. Um, and then, of course, we look at our ticket sales. <laughs> we always keep that information to kind of guess, you know, how the ticket sales the next year might go, um, what sort of funding we're realistically working with as we work through those venue decisions and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll try and Go ahead, Suzanne. <laughs> I guess I do cover a, a good portion, but it is never enough. Uh, we have to secure funding from alternative sources. Um, we try, have really consistently tried to keep the ticket price uh, reasonable for what we offer, especially since people already have to book a hotel, travel, drive uh, for the event. Uh, so ticket price, ticket price does not cover the actual expenses. We have to look at uh, vendor tables, sponsorship, uh, and then even smaller fundraising events throughout the year that our staff conduct and we conduct in our own comms. Um, and we gather that data and kind of extrapolate, uh, oh, how how can we do next year? Uh, how, would, how, can we, how can we charge per ticket to kind of cover all of these? So we, we work out these kind of ratios. Um, wedding, often those, those venues kind of have set packages and set prices. Um, so you can kind of determine beforehand what the capacity is, what the cost is, what they offer, and compare it against other venues as well. So it's not like we're surprised by any sort of like bills or charges. And caterers do that as well. You can get quotes ahead of time. Uh, packages and figure out what you want and uh, construct budgets to see like, okay, this is what we do with venue A or venue B or caterer A. And then something about our budget as well is uh, a reason why we, uh, our venues and our programming go hand in hand. Uh, they are gala spaces. So we provide gala, a gala event and gala programming. So they're very much in, enmeshed in what we offer. And so, since day two is a tea party, we typically go with different uh, venues and, and don't have the entire weekend take place in, take place in a single space, usually. Um, part of that is because of the programming difference in both of the days, and part of that is also uh, cost as well, because day one is such so much of a bigger day, those venues typically are more expensive. Um, and we could go for a different venue on the second day that offers different things at a, at a different price. All right, we're just about out of time, but I'm gonna to try to squeeze a couple more things in here. Um, so we've got a question about um, how do you approach brands, places, spaces, um, prep work before the event? So 
again, with our venues, most of them are wedding venues. And so they have websites that you can submit what's called an RFP. Um, and basically you're requesting a date, you're telling them how many people and you're kind of giving them an explanation of what um, you're gonna be doing in the space. So you could think of it a lot like just planning a wedding. Um, we have a lot of the same challenges that you might have planning a very large wedding every year. Um, and so that information is very easy to access usually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I think this person is also talking about brands uh, as well, and um, especially when as the it's gotten a little easier as we've been getting more well known. The earlier ones was just like emailing everybody, or like who has a contact form, mm -hmm. um, and getting no responses whatsoever. Um, and but as far as getting bigger brands. Um, we either know someone who knows someone, but also uh, most brands have a contact form on their website. They have email addresses, they have uh, info addresses, and uh, we just email them and uh, see what happens. Additionally, a big, um, a big thing that will help you in those endeavors is um, when you're networking, it is always an opportunity every conversation you have in the community is an opportunity to meet someone who knows someone. And so I think it is personally very important to always be humble and always be, um, you know, kind and thoughtful of other people because so many people in the community are willing and want to help you. They want to do something for other people. Um, you just have to find them and you have to make a connection with them and you never know when that might happen. So, um, just always uh, keep your eyes open for those opportunities. And again, just always just be nice. Be nice to everyone you meet um, and that'll take you really far. So um, I think that's about all the time we've got, um, but we really appreciated all of you taking the time out of your day to join us. And I hope this has been informative. Uh, yes, thank you all so much for uh, your continued support in attending Purgatorio as well as Paradiso in the past. Those of you that have been, uh, tickets for Paradiso are still available. Um, and uh, we've moved our dates to August. And I hope to see you all guys in person over there uh, at Union Station in Kansas City.